So it's a pleasure to be back and in the same hall here uh, for my second Leverholm lecture. Now, as the first one, the second one is very long. And I think I was told to keep it within the parameters of being able to have a little bit of conversation and discussion at the end, which will have to happen in an impromptu way at some point. We'll just end it. But just a note on long lectures, it doesn't really mean that one is more prepared. It actually means the opposite. There was someone, I think a philosopher, who was asked, uh, how long will it take you to prepare a 20-minute talk? And she said, three months. And well, how long will it take you to do um, an hour talk then? Oh. A month and a half. Well, how about if you were to teach for three hours straight? Oh, I can do that right now, was the answer. <laughs> so it's really a lack of sensibleness. In any case, uh, the subject of this evening is something that I care about quite a lot. And it connects um, the question of the exhibition, the question of the compost, the question of art made by people, the question of something maybe art made by non-people, and the question of speculative fabulation, SF, science fiction, speculative feminism, fooling around with things that are absolutely senseless. I would like to also speak about the art that refers to or represents non-humans, in particular animals in this case, and also the art, perhaps art made by non-humans. And then my core attempt with the documenta, in uh, one of the strands of the documenta was the possibility of sharing creativity. So it's collaborations between humans and non and non-humans. So uh, to distinguish between, I'll, I'll read the beginning, and then when I sort of lost track of it all, it'll be notes, and we'll just improvise. So to distinguish between the archive and the compost is to distinguish between inertia and live organism, between rationalistic classifications and procedural imaginative associations. This lecture is in praise of composts, of symbiotic interactions, of worlding, and will look at some art made by humans, the arts of non-humans, and the sharing of creativity between the many sentient beings that populate and make our world. I, of course, come from art, as I believe most of you do. But I dabble lovingly and amateurly here in biology, zoology, ethology, philosophy. I also use this occasion to question patriarchal forms of human exceptionalism, quote unquote, which we'll define a bit later. But it's somewhat related to states of exception, uh, permanent states of exception in the Agambian sense. So I would like to begin by reading the summary statement and wall text which accompanied the exhibition, Documenta 13, in 2013. I wrote on the wall for visitors, Documenta 13 is dedicated to artistic research and forms of imagination that explore commitment, matter, things, embodiment, and active living in connection with, yet not subordinated to, theory. These are terrains where politics are inseparable from a sensual, energetic, and worldly alliance between current research in various scientific and artistic fields and other knowledges, both ancient and contemporary. Documenta 13 is driven by a holistic and a non-logocentric vision that is skeptical of the contemporary belief in economic growth. It is shared with and recognizes the knowledges of all the animate and inanimate makers of the world, including people. Now, by writing including people as the last two words, 
I meant to suggest that the documenta would not be bound only to exhibiting or investigating the cultural productions of our species, but rather was an open field, less anthropocentric. This comes from a feminist trajectory, and I think Rosemary Truckle's motto, every animal is a female artist, as a provocative response to Joseph Beuys, jeder Mensch ein Künstler, every man, intending human, is an artist, is pertinent here to remember. Every animal is a female artist, as well as from a communitarian and ecological trajectory. From this perspective, the second one, it is helpful to use Tristan Garcia, the young French theoretician, summary of the possible nous, the possible we, in his book Nous, Animaux et Humains of 2011, We, Animals and Humans. In that, he speaks of four categories of the new on pages 58-59. One category, he begins his first one, is the thinker as an animalist. He who considers the new as comprising more than the human species, but within bounds of animality. Two, the thinker of the commons. He or she who rebuilds on a new basis the sense of the human new, on the basis of politics, of philosophy, of common software, any, anything, the commons. Three, the thinker of communitarianism. She or he who rebuilds the new on the basis of territorial links or on the basis of a common origin, a caste, a family, ethnicity, and so forth. Of course, communitarianism can be divided into two subgroups, a sort of leftist communitarianism and a very right-wing uh, reactionary communitarianism, but that's not his subject. And four, the thinker or the doer of ecology, she or he who thinks beyond all barriers, against all limits of the living world, to the entire biosphere, even at times including the inanimate, it's a cosmic dimension where no distinctions are possible. Now, I think, oddly enough, this last point was the perspective of my first Leverholm lecture when we spoke of <coughs> intra-action, photon entanglement, why matter matters, the indistinction between thought and matter, the inanimate and the animate on a subatomic level. Um, so I started the lectures with the reverse order <laughs> from Tristan Garcia's way of organizing these possible new. So today I would like to focus on the first of the four Garcia's categories. But before I do that, I would also like to sidetrack and briefly mention the archive versus the compost as procedural method. So that's the first paragraph archive as compost, and compost, not as compost. Uh, traditionally, an archive, and you all know this well, uh, uh, is a repository of traces and documents that are no longer useful. They are no longer on the desktop of our computers nor in the offices we work in. They may potentially be useful in the future, and therefore they are the creation in the present moment of a past for a future moment when what is put in the archive now becomes past. Archival materials are classified according to principles and hierarchical decisions, such as the uh, principle, provenance principle, PP, uh, of the 19th century uh, and, and other systems. Um, an archive is not distracted, distrahere. Furthermore, in its original definition, there is a difference between a collection and an archive. And uh, not definition, usage, usage I meant. Um, an archive has a system usually of ordering it, while a collection could but does not necessarily need one. And uh, originally the notion was that a collection of objects was the objects themselves, while you know, an archive was the collection of the traces, records, and documents of the objects, whether the objects are physical or immaterial. But
But in our digital age, we know that this distinction blurs, and thus an archive can contain things that are at once objects themselves and documentation of themselves, originals and copies. Contrary to this classical, to the classical view of the archive I just mentioned, Foucault in 69, but translated into English in 72, the year of Harold Zeman, my predecessor's Documenta 5, to make speculative fabulation here. In his chapter 5, the historical a priori in the archive wrote that what is important in the archive is not the contents of the archive, but the underlying structures of organization of the archive, which allows for certain things to be included in it and other things to be kept out because they are outside the frames of recognizability according to the, the discourses of the, of, the, of, the, of the time or of the archive. For example, a whole history of feminism might be excluded from an archive in a patriarchal system. The grammar underlying the archive are the underlying principles of an archive, a some, some sort of a subconscious organizing principle of a discourse in a certain time and place in history. And he looks at the ordering aspects of the archive. He speaks of it as the first law of what can be said, but it governs the, that governs the appearance of statements. It is not that which safeguards the event of a statement and preserves it for the future. It is at the root of the statement itself that this defines the system of its enunciability. It does not collect the dust of statements that have become inert. It is the system of their functioning. He was, of course, writing just after 1968, within a period of the revolutionary impulses uh, uh, and emancipa emancipatory impulses. For him, therefore, the archive is a discursive formation, and one become, becoming aware of it in order to not be subjugated to its system of knowledge. So insofar as a, one can have critical consciousness and see this underlying grammar, then one can somehow be free or come to some form of freedom. This is still what lies beneath the um, definition of art as the sort of minimum, deno minimum common denominator of art as needing some form of critical consciousness that is so dominant in the 90s and in the 80s as well. Uh, 25 years after Foucault, in 1994, at the outset of the mass usage of the internet and emails, that's the year I had my first email address, and it was the second email address in Italy. So for the young people, it's not a very old system of communication. Uh, it appeared there might be a free and infinite storage space all of a sudden in the virtual world at the time. Quite the contrary today with the financialization of digital storage space and bandwidth. Derrida that year wrote Archive Fever, which was his lecture in Cerisi, I think. Uh, uh, maybe not, uh, actually not. It was a lecture in, La in England on memory that he was invited to. The Cerisi lecture was L'animal que donc je suis, yeah. Um, which we'll talk about later, hopefully, <laughs> if there's time. Um, where he looked at the archival impulse from a Freudian perspective, stemming from Freud's musings on the mystic writing pad and memory. Archive fever is connected to our death drive, he found, insofar as it parallels the wish to repress and render inert materials by psychic removal. Freud initially said in his earliest texts that we tend to decrease things and psychically remove things and elements, our stories that are painful. Our drive, Eros, is a drive towards life. But when he saw that people coming back from World War I were remembering and repeating moments when a bomb fell, he noticed that people who were traumatized were repeating rather than removing psych painful moments. This did not fit in his early theories. He thus theorized the death drive, that within our psyche there is a self-destructive impulse, the impulse to destroy life. Eros and Thanatos, these are indeed the pillars of Freudian theory. It may be true, and one way of explaining psychic pain, perhaps it's one of the stories of the early 20th century. Uh, there is a balance in this story between these functions and other theories, such as sublimation, condensation, and so on, that are techniques for balancing these different drives. Now, when an exhibition is like a traditional archive, it is deadly. 
It is a storage. It is inert. It is about accumulating knowledge and power and communicating knowledge through the power of display. In the archival exhibition, the artworks are separate from each other, each in their own folder. They do not contaminate each other. They are separated and organized in a conceptual and theoretical framework of order. Griselda Pollock, here today, in her encounters in the Virtual Feminist Museum of 2007, however, argues for a, quote, expanded archive across time and space, reaching back and through also Abby Warburg, where objects and artworks are not ordered according to the traditional patriarchal art historical canons of nation style period and so forth, but as, quote, sites for the production of meanings and affects by means of their plastic operations, practices negotiating meanings shaped both by history and the unconscious. Now, Derrida used the Eros Thanatos tool from Freud to understand the apparent contradiction between the saving of things for some future usage and the fact that by archiving them you are destroying the exterior world, you are putting it away, like a collector who collects to store to make sense of the document at a later time. And yet, the problem is not that the elements, in, in my view, that the elements included by being archived are dead. The problem is, in my view, different. Because each item in the archive is discrete and separate from the others, in archive boxes, folders, they cannot perform symbiosis and cannot turn into fertile soil. The archive freezes things. It's, it is the opposite of a compost. On the other hand, it is surprising to me that Derrida did not see the other great area of Freud's thinking, the space and potentiality of dreams, and what we can do with them interpretatively and for our lives as forms of composting, as living compost archives, to the degree that the problem is not in the status of being alive or dead, uh, conscious or removed to the subconscious, but it concerns the symbiotic potential of the elements versus their forces of separate versus forces of their separation. The dreams dreams are not are excuse me are stories that symbiotically mix together elements to create new stories with new lives with. So that brings us to the compost. Now, the etymology of the word compost is uh, old uh, French, uh, originally, therefore, from Latin. Um, it is a mixture of leaves, manure for fertilizing land. It's already used in the late Middle Ages, but it's also used as condiment. And it comes from composita, uh, coming from the Latin compositus, which is the past participle of componere, which is to put together, to put things together. The fertilizer sense is attested in English from the 1580s, says the internet. And the French word uh, is a 19th century borrowing from English. So it goes back and forth in a composting of languages. Now, when we think of it as a fertilizing so production of soil, or it is basically organic matter that has decomposed and recycled uh, in, as fertilizer. And it is a key ingredient in organic farming. At the simplest level, the process of composting simply requires making a heap of wetted organic matter, leaves and green food waste, and waiting for the materials to break down into hummus after some weeks or months. There are, of course, modern methods to accelerate and make sure that composting works properly with measured inputs of water, air, carbon, and nitrogen-rich materials, because you need a balance of nitrogen-rich and carbon-rich materials. The decomposition is aided by shredding the plant matter nowadays, adding water and ensuring that there's proper aeration. Worms and fungi, fungi further break up the material. And Bacteria that is in air, aerobic bacteria, manage the chemical process and convert into heat, carbon dioxide, and ammonium. 
The ammonium is then converted by bacteria into plant nourishing nitrates and nitrates through the process of nitrification. So you need a balance of dry brown plants and animal leftovers and nitrogen based like green veggies. With that proper mixture you get this alchemical thing which is soil. Uh, and there are many kinds of microorganisms in compost that make it very alive and make the process work. The most common are bacteria. And then there are other uh, things. We said fun fungi. Uh, we, there are protozoa that help consume the bacteria, fungi, and microorganic particles. Uh, and these are protozoa are small unicellular eukaryotic organisms. We'll speak about prokaryotes and eukaryotes in a few minutes. They are very interesting in relation to democracy and love. Um, and other elements exist in this composting. So I see Pollock's virtual feminist museum um, as a sort of anti-archive actually, as an expanded archive of sorts, as, but very much as a compost exhibition in theory, except for the fact that uh, there can be cases where an exhibition is also a transformative site in itself, where composting occurs, something of an organism in the state of the propositional, where um, Christina Buch's garden for butterflies m migrates into Pierre Huyck's untilled, where certain things are contaminated in different ways, so that it's quite unclear also where the boundaries of one work is and where the beginnings of another work is, whether Kai Altoff and, and Seal Floyer are part of Ryan Gander's work or not. And there are certain possibilities of setting into the pr process of composting a proposition like Documenta. So I see Documenta as this as, as a set of intra-acting, to use again Karen Barad's word, and entangled propositions around a number of distractions and positions, pooling the viewers and artworks in different directions and intensities that allow through time and space and airiness amongst them for a cultural composting that may generate new stories of a worldly becoming with a flourishing of life on the planet through the many other stories that will come um, completely uh, uh, with no relation, apparent relations to document at all. And I remind you that I always ask what stories do we want to tell so that other, uh, uh, taken uh, ref from Donna Haraway, what stories do we want to tell so that other stories may be told? What stories did the artist bear witness to so that other stories may be told? So to be in the state of the propositional, of note-taking, of composting, as opposed to archiving, literally and metaphorically. Now, I'd, the second paragraph of this is uh, concerning the notion of worlding. And we're slowly going to hover into the preciser topics of this evening. So Documenta 13 and Wilding, for those who were not here at the first uh, lecture or who did not take part in the institute, I'd like to um, tell you that as a compost, Documenta 13 was not organized around any attempt to read historical conditions through art today, <clears throat> or the ways in which art's languages and materials might represent these historical conditions of the world today. It is not a worldly exhibition in that sense. Participants in Documenta 13, however, came from a range of fields of activity. They came mostly from art, but they also came from science, including physics and biology, eco-architecture and organic agri agriculture, renewable energy research, philosophy, anthropology, political theory, language and literature studies, including fiction and poetry. They contributed to a space that aimed to explore how these different forms of knowledge lie at the heart of the active exercise of reimagining the world. And that is what I meant by worlding, to actively speculate, act, tell stories together, or riffing off of others 
and their stories to touch matters, materials, narratives, and organisms that are semiotic chimeras that multiply complexity, vitality, flourishing, and joy in the world rather than comment on crisis and catastrophe. This notion of multiform, quote, multiform worlding practice, unquote, or of multi species storytelling in the feminist mode, unquote, or of quote, art in the biological, ecological, and cyborg modes, unquote. And uh, these are three uh, excerpts, of sentences from Donna Haraway's acceptance comments for her 2011 Pilgrim Award. She was at the time already advisor to the Documenta while, while writing about uh, multi-species storytellings in the feminist mode and art in the biological, ecological, and cyborg modes characterized the compost that was to become Documenta 13. However, even though coming from all these different areas, what the participants did and what they exhibited, quote unquote, in Documenta, may or may not have been art. And one could ask that question of Pierre Rigue's dump, matrix, primordial spot of recycling, growth, and life storage space for sculpture and a besieged sculpture, a retreat for besieged sculpture and bees. However, whether what these participants did and what they exhibited in Documenta 13 was or was not art, what is important to me was that their acts, gestures, thoughts, and knowledge making produced and were produced by circumstances that are readable by art, aspects that art can cope with and absorb. Now, one of the attempts within this general frame of documenta was to not put human thought hierarchically above the ability of other species and things to think or produce knowledge. This sounds like the biggest paradox ever, given that art is such a human activity in the way that we consider it normally. This does not mean that we are always able to access these other knowledges Although scientists, and particular biologists, ethologists, those who study animal behavior, physicists, do attempt to learn them. How, for example, photons dance and think together. How, another case, the horse called Hans in Berlin in 1904 surprised a group of veterinarians, psychologists, teachers, and zoologists by his prodigious arithmetical abilities in multiplication and divisions where he gave the correct result number by beating his hoof the number of times corresponding, until a former mathematician, von Osten, realized that the animal was actually not counting, but reading unintentional body movements and gestures of the researchers themselves, because he was not able to count when the person asking him to make the calculation was absent from his presence and view. Quote, Vincienne Desprez, another participant in the documenta, a philosopher and uh, um, scientist, ethologist, uh, writes in her article, The Body We Care For, Figures of Anthropozoogenesis, from 2004, I quote her, the horse could not count, but he could do something more interesting. Not only could he read bodies, but he could make human bodies be moved and affected and move and affect other beings and perform things without their owner's knowledge probably something in the twitching of the eye, in the expectation that the, num the right number had arrived and the horse stopped beating the hoof. Um, that's quite something for animal machines who don't feel anything, according to Descartes. Now, I would like to show you a video um, that was made by one of the participants of Documenta 13. And that refers to this story of Hans.
7 minus 4. Tausend sechshundertdreiundvierzig minus tausend sechshundertachtunddreißig. Of course, this work could, could uh, uh, well be thought about and analyzed also in reference to institutional repressive conditions uh, and also um, in terms of the crowd and the spectacle. However, I will let it go now and continue on with our considerations. So such considerations as Vincienne Desprez uh, about the horse story offer a special perspective onto our own thinking. They make us more humble, able to see the partiality of human agency and they encourage a point of view that is less, less anthropocentric and far from the human exceptionalism that characterized traditional philosophy until very recently, and even still does today. Paradoxically, humanistic positions are the cause of our having become less humane and less compassionate beings on the planet. Precisely in the age of what some people call the Anthropocene, where the destiny of the planet may depend on the choices and actions of one species, the human, we break away from the human exceptionalism which has characterized most religious monotheistic thinking as well as traditional lay philosophy. It's almost the only thing they have in common. Up to its re recent radical questioning by thinkers such as quantum physicist and philosopher Karen Barad or the feminist cultural the theory critic, uh, theory, the, the everything, Donna Haraway, uh, in her Cyborg Manifesto, and notably in her book, When Species Meet, published in 2008. The already mentioned ethologist and philosopher Vincienne Desprez, Belgian, who, among other things, studies the relations between non-human animals and scientists in scientific research contexts. For example, in her book, Pensée comme un rat, 2009, where she studies how the rats in, in, in science environments influence and teach and affect the scientists doing their tests. Or Jacques Derrida, again, who in his 1997 lecture, L'animal que donc je suis, à suivre, the animal that therefore I am, to be followed, questions his own philosophical tradition in which the non-human animal has always been, has most often been a figure of radical otherness. This he says. Actually, a recent book by Daniel Heller-Rosen, I would say, argues that that's not true, that there is an, another undercurrent that traverses also uh, as an undercurrent the history of um, Western philosophy. This perspective towards a de-anthropocentrization of thought and a multi-species coevolution proposes to move away from the binary oppositions between the human and the so-called natural, the organic other being part of that sphere, the sphere that was the sphere of the slave, the non-citizen, the woman, the embryo, the ethnic other, the so-called animal, the so-called vegetal. 
as well as between the human and the machinic, the inorganic other, the technological. Indeed, uh, Donna Haraway's ecological vision is certainly not a neo-romantic view of reinforcing the nature-culture divide by embracing a world without machines or technology. She says, it's turtles all the way down. Even uh, there is a technology by which cells interact, for example, interact. Speaking of art, in his late aesthetic theory, which is one of my favorite books, Adorno, uh, from 1970, Adorno said, it has become self-evident that nothing concerning art is self-evident anymore. Not its inner life, not its relations to the whole, not even its right to exist." Unquote. Indeed, we do not know what art is until it is no longer that which it was. Thus, it has been a sphere of human activity which continuously questions its own limits, its own existence, its own meaning. Art often exists only in so far as it is an amateurial activity, indeed, in a state of the propositional and never of constituted knowledge and professionality. Although, of course, drawing and image making are amongst the most ancient and characteristic activities of, not, of humans, it is not a given, according to the possible usages of the term art, that do not necessarily involve the requirement of human will, rationality, nor intentionality, that non-human beings, animate and inanimate, are excluded from creative activity if we are to use a broader sense of art making and from the faculty of imagination. Of course, um, I use creativity um, with caution, knowing that it is a fraught term in our age of creative capitalism and so on. But I use it in the way that it was used by Whitehead and all the um, people who took it away from being only a godly, only God created term. Um, in, in, and furthermore, because we become ourselves, we become with others ourselves, we are, and we are constituted relationality, re relationally with an enormous amount of non-humans within our own even bodies. The DNA of our bodies is very much belonging to other species and agents that we don't actually see and that we are host to. It seems quite strange to continue with this opposition of the human subject to the non-human. So now I would like to look for a moment better at this trajectory of human exceptionalism and its critique, which I mentioned I'd go back to. So this is part three. The story of human exceptionalism in the West and a little bit of history of its critique. Generally speaking, it is known that human exceptionalism in Western thinking comes forcefully into our way of thinking with the classical dogmatic Greek philosophy and specifically with Aristotle. Greek thought, however, and in particular skepticism, of which I am a great admirer, recognized, was not in favor of Aristotle's dogmatic vision of the distinction between the human and the non-human animals, the human being the animal with reason. Indeed, the skeptics who were thinking after the times of Aristotle, and therefore uh, Pyrrhus the Great at the time of Alexander the Great in 300 to 70 BC, and later Sextus Empiricus, 160 to 210 AD. I know these dates are ridiculous. We could calculate before now. Some people calculate before now, but then you have to add 2000 years. It's complicated. Some people write BCE before the Common Era. It's a mess. So I'm just going to just use those traditional ways, which of course are wrong, because who cares about before and after Christ? obviously. But um, just pour parler, we just use it. We, otherwise, we cannot even use the meter. Who cares about Sèvres in Paris? So, um, or the inch, for that matter. Let me not go off. Um, skept so skepticism, which certainly is not pre-Socratic thought, 
comes uh, certainly uh, um, indicates that there uh, that there are, that there are sentient beings and that humans and non-humans have different abilities and and organs, sense organs, and um, um, so forth, that are, however, uh, uh, not in a hierarchical uh, position. So Sextus Empiricus, in his 10 tropes, where he writes the proof that we should be skeptics and not believe in one unique truth, uh, we always can pit one truth against another truth and uh, that are valid, which is not relativism because we cannot pit all things against each other, but some things that are true can always be pit, uh, pitted against others that are true, uh, arriving at a suspension of judgment and a state of ataraxia, which means you cannot have any um, definitive solution or ideology or position. His first trope to prove that is that we um, that animals have reason, they feel, they suffer, they judge, they have language, and they have arts. Um, I didn't bring the trope with me uh, to read. It's in my suitcase, but that's good because otherwise we don't have enough time. But uh, he goes through all the different cases and examples of such um, examples from dogs barking in a certain way if they're angry, happy, afraid to different systems of communication amongst non-humans and because we cannot know the perspective of the dog on to the world because we do not have the same sense organs then we cannot say that there is an absolute truth because our perception of the world is always partial at least and for sure in respect to that of the non-human. That was the first trope. Now, interestingly, Daniel Heller-Roazen, in his book, The Inner Touch, Archaeology of Sensation, it came out in 2007, and in particular in the chapter Historia Animalium, notes that something else. He, he doesn't speak about the skeptics, which is, I believe, uh, I don't know why he doesn't, but he does uh, argue that there is this undercurrent of uh, non-human exceptionalist thought that is present in Greek thought in the pre-Socratic period, Democritus, and so on. Uh, and what he will do is a very interesting recovery of Aristotle for our purposes. In the chapter Historia Animalium, he notes that although Aristotle's De Anima is used traditionally to mark the moment in which man is separated from other animals, because, a ra because he, he, in this case we can say he, is a rational being, that is with logos. Zo zoion logon ekton. Um, uh, a living being possessing language, so it's actually having language. Um, thus making the birth of canonical human exceptionalism even uh, for today. This Aristotelian statement went in contrast with the pre-Socratic predecessors he, as I just mentioned, mentions, from Homer to Parmenides to Democritus. For them, there was no clear distinction between esthesis, the sensation, the, 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 to feel the world. There was no clear distinction between esthesis and nos. So, and the knowing, the thinking, the logos. They may have accepted that there were differences of degree, the pre-Socratic, but not of nature between species. So you, they could accept that a certain animal would have a higher form of reasoning and so on, but not a difference of nature, of, of a qualitative difference. Aristotle's division abolishes the vision of an integrated animal, therefore. Of, sentient, of, of an integrated animal life of sentient beings in the world, and certainly in Western thought. Helle Roazen, however, this is what interests me, reminds us that since the human animal was from then on defined as having reason, which the others do not have, it implies that by a negative logic, he says that that implies that if we separate off this quality of the human, the, the, the reasonableness. We separate it off, there still is a human 
because it is a quality, a plus. And therefore, what remains, the remainder, the non-human within the human, quote, an element that persists in human nature without altogether coinciding with it, unquote, has always lurked in the background, even in Western thought. The notion of a, quote, animality within the human as well. This is what ends up being Nietzsche, and it ends up being Deleuze, and so on. And this is why Donna Haraway doesn't really like Deleuze, and neither do I, in that chapter of um, Mille Plateaux that speaks about the wolves and the flying vaginas. Because it is contingent on the fact that there is the, this other part, which is the reasonable part, which is an extra, which is a plus to this undercurrent, which is the animality that we lose touch with, that we want to get back in touch with, and so forth. Whereas uh, our feeling is of an integrated form of knowledge of the world, where esthesis and logos are not separate. So the, lotion, the notion of an animality within the human as well uh, persists. Um, it is the esthesis, a shared region of sensation, some sort of single power ascribed to all animals. Some thought of it as nos, others thought of it as psyche, the soul, <coughs> as Socrates' dog in the Republic, whose powers of recognition partake of a love and knowledge. For Aristotle, however, Heller Roisin reminds us that he is not a Descartian. This is what is most important to me, is that Heller Roisin says, you cannot identify Descartes' position on animality and Aristotle. Because there is something between the purely nutritive abilities of plants, the trepticon, and the contemplative faculties of humans. There are other faculties shared by human and non-human animals. And I quote, and th that Aristotle acknowledges, that I quote, between the two extremes of nourishment, pure nourishment, pure survival nourishment, and thought, lies the common terrain of animal life, perception. At times, Aristotle described it as consisting of several faculties, which include imagination, fantasia, desire, orexis, pain, pleasure, appetite, and sensation, esthesis. Thus, all animals for Aristotle have, unquote, have principles of sensation and feel that they can feel, that they have forms of consciousness that were later denied them by modern rationalism and by Descartes in particular. Quote, the sensitive animals startlingly closer to the self-conscious beings of modern thought, since every sense in the peripatetic doctrine is of itself receptive not only to the sensible quality but also to its own apprehension, this is it, sensible not receptive not only to the sensible quality but also to its own apprehension of it. One must conclude that I that, that perceiving that perceiving animals for Aristotle or Aristotle jointly perceive soon an estate. In other words, he notes that non-human animals can feel that they are feeling. So <clears throat> for Aristotle a plant cannot feel that it is feeling. Now we would deny that as well today. But Aristotle positions the non-human animal in a form of consciousness whereby there is consciousness that one is perceiving, consciousness that one is feeling. We sense that we are seeing, we sense that we are hearing. There is consciousness because there was awareness. So this is the awareness, this consciousness of feeling, that then actually gets denied in the progression of human exceptionalism once monotheistic religion, Christian religion in particular, becomes dominant. Um, and it is um, St. Augustine in his Confessions, which I was going to read some examples, but we can read them in the Institute tomorrow, would be an example of this passage, this radicalization of the Aristotelian passage. Uh, and when uh, a critique of human exceptionalism begins, when animal rights movements begin, again, in Western thought, which is in the Enlightenment, which is at the with Jeremy Bentham, in his notion that we share suffering and the ability to suffer with the animals, and therefore, because the animal suffers, there must be compassion, and therefore protection, animal rights as 
protection of animals emerges with this moment of compassionate uh, sense of the other animal begins in the late 1700s. This is parallel with also the abolitionist slavery movements in the West. Interestingly, and I'm just going to go very quickly over this because we want to arrive at art again, but um, interestingly to me is the fact that <clears throat> the moment in which humans are able to acknowledge a much closer tie to the non-human animal, which is in the 19th century with the development of evolutionary thought, Darwin, it is precisely the moment where our lives are separated from the non-human species. When the cities have less and less horses, less and less animals except for the domestic animal, when we separate our bodies from the bodies of the non-human, are we able to intellectually acknowledge and integrate the idea of evolution and of kinship, which is a kinship, however, distanced in time and through time, if not through geography, which is very parallel to what occurs with Orientalism. A celebration of the Oriental other, Edward Said writes, as you know, is contingent on a distancing in time as well of the great Arab and Islamic art. So <laughs> there is the distancing in time of our kinship with the non-humans through evolutionary thought, which allows that to be accepted as, 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 um, as so-called truth. Um, so we've gone through this. Uh, now Montaigne, uh, to go backwards again, one of the skeptics of history was Montaigne. And Montaigne, uh, very interestingly, in the late 1500s, he writes a text where he again says that non-human species, of course, have language because how the hell could they do everything that they do if they can't communicate, and so on. And it is Descartes, of course, that I just mentioned to you in his 1649 essay, says that because they do not feel, because they are not conscious of feeling, their perceptions, it is an automatism if an autopsied animal yells during the autopsy. And therefore, it is, because it is more fruitful for science to, perf to perform a scientific study on a live animal rather than on a dead animal, we mustn't care about the fact that they are yelling because they don't have the consciousness of their own suffering. That was before Bentham, of course. I went backward and forward. Now, in, <clears throat> in art, the question becomes relevant to us in art, I would say, with Kant in the late 1700s. He does pay attention to animals and their shared abilities with humans in his critique of judgment. But, and he does say that non-human animals have a sense of, or, or let's say nature as a whole has, a, has, has beauty, but no sense of beauty, has no consciousness of beauty, but has beauty. Uh, he does say that, um, it is not art that when a beehive is made by bees, it cannot be said to be architecture or art because there is no intention in the bees to make that form of architecture. Now, of course, we all know from von Fritsch onwards, 1948, discovering the bee dance and all the work of ethologists of the last century, that it is absurd to think that bees do not have intention in and, and or beavers do not have intention in their architecture and in their making. The la so the, the question that they are not architects can, according to how Kant distinguished architect from na natural production by non-human animals, fell very soon with early ethology. The subsequent question is, but do they play? Is there leisure in what they do? Uh, do, they, do they have a sense of wasting time in, in, in something aesthetic, that falls down now in the most recent research of feminist science studies, such as Natasha Myers and Carla Hustak's study of the relations between orchids and insects and many other uh, works that are going on now where it is quite clear that non-humans do also play and do also do aesthetic things for pure pleasure. Darwin noticed that himself, and he couldn't make sense of that. And that's when he developed the idea that it's not only for survival, 
uh, but it's also for uh, reproduction of the species through sexuality that would explain some of these anomalous phenomena in nature. Now, I would argue that that's probably why we make art also, uh, to, to be together, to share these stories together, and it has something to do with mating and sexuality and desire, obviously. You know, anyone who has done anything thinking deeply in the question of why we write, why we write poetry, why we, why we make music, why we do this, it has so much to do with what it is to be together, and what it is to be together has to do with the survival of the species. So either all art is utilitarian and useful, or all art is not, but we cannot necessarily distinguish one from the other as we have over the last thousand years. Okay, I'm going to skip Blake, uh, who was a contemporary of Bentham, and he wrote, A robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. <laughs> Beginning of that. But um, would like to remind you, I'm skipping Whitehead and skipping Bateson, would like to remind you that the, the real kind of animal rights movement and the arriving at the idea of speciesism, which is a neologism, it's a new word created by a man called Ryder in 1970, uh, def defended and broadened to everybody through a man called Pete Seeger, Pete Singer, sorry, he was a singer, 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 <laughs> not singer though, in 1975 um, with the animal liberation movement spoke about speciesism as an extension of racism. Uh, and uh, that of course is part of our much more recent history. Uh, John Berger, interesting, another contamination, John Berger who has written so much about looking at art, how we look at art, he also wrote a beautiful text in 1976 about why look at animals and he's looking at the animals in the zoo and it's a very beautiful, beautiful text. So um, we can't do all this, though. Uh, Donna Haraway comes uh, speaking about sharing suffering, living and dying, that we're all messmates. We eat each other. The question is, who is going to eat who at what moment? But basically, we cannot continue with the idea that we cannot give agency to the non-human, because if we give agency to the non-human, we all have to become vegetarians. This makes no sense, because all life is made from eating life of one sort or another. The question is, whose turn is it? And when? Lynn Margulis. OK, uh, I wanted to speak to you about Lynn Margulis, who is a great, great woman. Uh, she was a biologist who didn't win the Nobel Prize, but should have, who died in 2011. <laughs> Too soon, I hadn't made contact with her. I was very sad about that. Uh, and her great discovery was, in 1966, the origin of eukaryotic cells. Now, traditionally, we know that life is divided, basically, there are like two basic kinds of cells, the prokaryote cells and the eukary eukary I don't know how you pronounce it, eukaryotic cells. The eukaryotic cells have organelles with membranes within them, and that would be the distinction. Bacteria is a unicellular prokaryote cell, and um, these, are pro these are prokaryote cells. And this is a, uh, showing you how it's made. And the um, eukaryote cells ha are more complex. And what she comes out with is discovering endosymbiosis, that actually in the history of the life on the planet, uh, various prokaryote cells merged and um, ate other cells of their own species, <laughs> parting bites, sharing suffering. And that basically was the biggest evolutionary shift in the history of the planet. And so it brings us to a notion of evolution that is a little bit far from the 19th century colonial period evolutionary vision of a line of progression <coughs> and survival of the fittest. And it balances it with, uh, not only with the exceptions to that, but balances it with a notion of evolution coming also through sentient beings perceiving an abilities, bonding and sharing those abilities and becoming an entity. So that evolution also comes from composting on the simplest level. Uh, these are examples and pictures of eukaryotic cells. And I wanted to show you Claire Pentecost for a minute. As you can see, she's drawing cells. And this is her notebook for Documenta. And in the Documenta, um, <clears throat> Claire Pentecost decided that her work would apparently be a, a, a sculpture made with soil. These are her soil ergs. 
and they look like ling ling lingots of gold. Of course, there's an irony, a reference to the hoarding of gold and the actually even the loss of the gold standard in this financialization of money in our time. And she was making ma different kinds of money um, with ecological figures like Vandana Shiva painted on these watercolors that are made with soil that she made with uh, colleagues at the bioagricultural department of the Witzenhausen University near Kassel, which is the oldest and first and most prominent bioagricultural department in all of Germany. And so she worked with them. They have farms outside of Kassel. And she lived in Kassel and made the soil with which she made these sculptures. Now, of course, the soil uh, is <laughs> her. Let's say that her sculptures are a collaboration with all of these different elements that worked together with her to make the soil. And that's a little close up vision of that. Uh, so it, does, it doesn't quite, it, it looks like something that I wanted to talk to you about at the end, which is sharing creativity and sharing art making. Um, OK, I w I'm now going to go to the next chapter. But just before that, I wanted to read, uh, this I will read, because it's very beautiful, um, par paragraph of Donna Haraway's Against Human Exceptionalism, to close that paragraph. Quote, Companion species are engaged in the old art of terraforming, making terra, Gaia, Earth. They are the players in a mathematical SF. SF stands for speculative fabulation, science fiction, uh, speculative feminism, etc. Equation that describes terra polis, finished once and for all with the Kantian globalizing cosmopolitics and grumpy human exceptionalist Heideggerian welding, because Heidegger also used the word welding. And he uses it in the way that Agamben uses it, which is Heideggerian, which is why Agamben, in his text on the animal, uh, in Aperto, is a text which really follows on the tradition of separation, not on the tradition, on the anti-human exceptionalist tradition. For, for Heidegger, the only animal that worlds is the human, because able to fare mondi, weltmachen, which means to understand that we are here and now and to bring with our uh, phenomenological perception of being in the world a sense of, I love Heidegger too. It's like crazy. I compost Haraway and Heidegger, but she doesn't. So she says, uh, finished once and for all with Kantian globalizing cosmopolitics and grumpy human exceptionalist Heideggerian worlding, terapolis is a mongrel word composted in a micro resume of Greek and Latin rootlets and their symbionts. Terra polis, because polis is Greek and terra is Latin. She's playing on these different genealogy, different roots. Exists in the SF web of always too much connection, where response ability must be cobbled together, not in the existentialist and bondless, lonely man-making gap theorized by Heidegger and his followers. Terra polis is rich in world, inoculated against post-humanism, but rich in compost, inoculated against human exceptionalism, but rich in humus, ripe for multi-species storytelling. This terra polis is not the home world for the human as homo, that ever parabolic re and d to messing self-image of the same but for the human that is transmogrified in etymological Indo-European slate of tongue into guman, that worker of and in soil. My SF critters are beings of the mud, not the sky. My linguist and ancient civilization's scholar friends tell me that this guman is Adama Adam, composted from all available genders and genres, and competent to make a home world for Battlestar Galactica in struggle, certainly, but no longer in a state of permanent war. This terra polis has kin-making, cat's cradle, string figure, SF relations with Isabel Stenger's kind of fleshy cosmopolitics, so against the cosmopolitics of the Enlightenment that you know that you're a worldly traveler, and SF writers practicing of welding. She refers to Le Guin and to Oct Butler and other, we'll get to that maybe, we could have gotten to that. So I wanted to now shift gears, having framed 
the situation as I see it and where I situate myself. Uh, let's look at something that is very, you could say, human exceptionalist, which is the representation of animals by humans in the history of human art. But I do this because you think, I think, that animals don't do that. But I don't think that. I think all species represent other species. And so does Hannah Arendt in an odd way through her reading of Adolf Portman, which we might get to, maybe, in another world, in another life. But let's look, just a sweeping look at some images in art history. What has been the representation of non-humans, particularly animals? as they are the closest to humans amongst all the live organisms on the planet. But of course, we could also look at the representation of plants in another lecture and so on. And what are the narratives that, through which these have been looked at when, since their discovery, and which is rather recent, these uh, cave paintings? So the Chauvet cave painting, these horses, uh, are of the Paleolithic, so maybe 25, 30,000 BC. And they were found, as you know, very recently in 1994. And it's one of the most significant prehistoric art sites because it's thousands of years prior Altamira. And of course, became the subject of a film that you might have seen. That's uh, an OK film. Let's just look at it. Uh, I mean, what we, do, we, we don't know why they're painted in this realistic way. There are many conjectures. Um, we don't know why it looks like a futurist painting, but it sort of does. There are animal bones found on the floor of the caves, as well as chalk from burnt trees, the f fires. And these caves are therefore different from the Altamira ones that are very far and were not um, inhabited at all, because some of the theories are that these were deep, deep in the recesses of the mountains and not seen by anybody when they were looking at Altamira caves. And therefore, uh, they were ritual magic for the, for the hunting and so on. But in this case, we find many traces of presence of animals in the caves and humans as well in the caves. Um, this is Altamira, actually, caves. So 16,000 years ago in Spain. And they were found uh, in 1880. So again, it's an interesting archaeological find at the time of our wanting to separate from the animals in, through time, but connect to them at the same time. Um, finally, the acknowledgment that these were authentic came only in 1902. And so when Arnold Hauser or Ernst Gombrich write about them, it's not that much after, actually. Uh, here I wanted you to see a Chinese vase at 5000 to 2000 BC of the Neolithic Yellow River civilization. It's an example of a useful object, which, however, is made in the shape of some form of animal. This are uh, in instead hunters camouflaged as prey, or so it is said. I'm not sure they are hunters <laughs> camouflaged as prey. That's what the art historian said. And uh, you know, putting on heads of animals to hunt. And these are from the uh, North uh, Algeria, the Sahara Desert uh, area. They could be a sense of coevolution or closeness or nearness between species. Uh, they could be representation of a certain form of emotion or of trying to, to um, well, William Kintridge, I think, when he draws, he dances with the drawing. And I think there are relations between what he draws and how he draws. So there, there, there might be just the impulse to somehow become the thing that one is drawing. Uh, this is a interesting goats. They say they are goats from Babylonia, Assyria, about 1900 BC. Certainly in these early images, we do not see conflict between the human and the animal. We do not see human exceptionalism coming through. I make you notice this even though you don't, because you will notice it in contrast with the later images. Here, not only do you not see human exceptionalism in this Egyptian uh, 26th dynasty, so about 600 BC, 
image, uh, you actually see a subordination of the human form to the uh, non-human, which is certainly in line with a society that's based on agriculture, and these are basically the computers of the time. And nor do you see actually human exceptionalism in this, which is uh, from the Parthenon frieze, so a British Museum, 440 BC. However, you see something different from here. You do see a form of the animal as prosthetic to the human. So the rider's body and the body of the animal become one body, something much closer to this. This is a second century AD Han Dynasty earthenware, a sleeping dog. You don't really see that on a Parthenon frieze which tells us something about time, action, in s different societies and civilization, are the notion of uh, what is valuable if, if, if re for example, rest time, not time to, to do things. Uh, you don't see that in, in Egyptian either. Egyptian work is always doing something with the animals. It's always, it's a kind of Heideggerian life. You know, it's like doing. Um, this is a, Septa Matrica, it's uh, seven mothers, an image again of a human, non-human chimera, symbiont from the 10th century in northern, northern India. This of course is a very well known, we are coming to the modern period, we have Dürer, the young hare from 1502, watercolor, of course celebrated for the detail, almost photographic detail of the study and the light on the, on the um, hitting the body and the, and the fur. And of course, we are in a modern age. You know, it is an age of precision, which is starting to be of value. And it, we are starting to separate from the non-human in a very distinct way through the vision, through the gaze, and through perspective, and the hand the precision of the hand, which will become the precision of the tool. However, Dominichino idealizes an earlier period in 1602 in, with his fanciulla with Leo Corno, idealizes an earlier period of uh, chimeras in this embrace between the woman and the unicorn, which is, of course, a kind of a male fantasy as well. And we have Rembrandt, The Slaughtered Ox, 1665, and a lot of anatomical work is going on at the time, falling into a non-Christian world where the crucifix is our non-human world, which is crucified. And here we have a very clearly human exceptionalist representation. It is... Um, 17th century etching of a battle between a prince and a lion. However, in Japan at the same time, we don't have this yet, this attitude. The mountain and the body of the chimp are almost one. But we do have it in this very detached, detailed colonial picture from the 19th century rhinos. Again, not based in this case even on observation, as maybe the Durer was, but based on observation of the Durer uh, etching, which was also based on a fantasy. And the, here we have this very sad archive of dead animals in a 19th century etching of a naturalist at work with his exotic animals. So the human exceptionalism runs parallel to colonialism and so on, it's increased. But early 20th century, Giacomo Balla, we go back to those first cave paintings somehow. Representation of the non-human as a movement. However, it is not the movement of the running through the forests or whatever with, in, at the time of Chauvet. It's actually called a can, a do, not a can, a cane with guinzaglio, a, a dog with a leash. So movement is accepted, and the relationship between the human and non-human is accepted in the urban, urban environment on the condition of domestication and imprisonment with the leash, basically. So this, is the this painting is never discussed as a painting about the leash, which is 
incredible to me, you know. There's not been one text about the leash in this painting. Only about representation of movement in relation to the machine movement, machine the wheels in other paintings by futurists, and the, the, the animal is actually a machine. So this is actually a Descartian position in this painting that emerges. However, with Arte Povera in the 1960s, we have a revolu late 1960s revolutionary movements, hippie <coughs> generation, and so forth, the breaking of traditional canons of what is art and what are materials, the birth of performance art, and so on. And this is a performance, of course, but it is a performance piece with non-humans, uh, which today would be questioned as um, leashes. But at the time when Cornelis did it, I think it, sh it needs to be situated in its time. This was a gallery, art gallery, um, made in Rome in an previous garage for cars, renovated into white cube. So the artist pulls the garage back, the, the art gallery back to being what it was. It reveals its context. It was a garage. But he puts not the cars, not the automobiles, but he pulls it back to a pre-modern time when we had to share with non-humans our travel and mules are considered stupid, but they're actually amongst the most so-called intelligent animals because you have to convince mules to move. If you don't convince them that there's a wise reason for doing it, they won't do it and they'll sit there for two hours. So when we share work with non-humans in our society, we are actually sharing work with sentient beings. So it's much more complex. You know, you have uh, workers' rights and many things to deal with. So. He goes to this against, of course, the equestrian <coughs> monument of earlier art. Then there is, of course, Joseph Boyce's 1974, I Like America and America Likes Me, the performance where he stays with the Coyote in New York in René Bloch's gallery for a while. And then I thought I would <laughs> bring in something of your country, which is Damien Hirst's piece. Um, which is, I think, a 1991 piece that was then in the exhibition Sensation. And he says that this piece is about the fact that we deny death, that we don't want to acknowledge that there's death. And so he puts the biggest possible dead body. And in fact, the title is somehow referred to death, I think. Uh, you may remember the title. The impossibility of death in the mind of the living. Yes. So I think. What this really, the interesting, in, in this line of images, what this reveals is the interesting uh, desensitization towards other bodies and matter that matters in the digital age and in the age of advanced flow of images to the degree that such a heavy, large object that is a dead animal uh, causes no empathy, no compassion whatsoever. So it's in its more formaldehyde and so on. This was the text that Kant, I mentioned to you. It is only uh, production through freedom, i.e. through an act of will that places reason at the basis of its action that should be termed art. For although we are pleased to call what bees produce, their regularly constituted cells, a work of art, we only do so on the strength of an analogy with art. That is to say, as soon as we call to mind that no rational deliberation forms the basis of their labor, we say at once that it is a product of their nature, of instinct, and it is only to their creator that we ascribe it as art, which is God. Now, I divided this up into different things. I can't even remember what I meant, but here we are going. <laughs> so, um, this has nothing to do with us, what I'm going to show you now. Okay, this is a beaver. Now, beavers have, I quote James Gould, have engineering abilities when they build dams that are comparable with the calculations needed to build pyramids or the Panama Canal. These rodents calculate the power of the water flow, the force that the water exercises. They cut down trees after those calculations and back and forth during those calculations 
to then arrive at the appropriate sized pieces of wood. They build paths and dig canals, which they use to transport tree trunks and pieces of wood to the chosen building spot for their dams. They build rooms and homes that are only accessible, you see on the, on the right, so you cannot see them in this case. They're on the two sides of the water. They build their homes and their cities that are only accessible from underwater doorways. It is a way of, main t of protection from uh, in invasion of others. It's their locks. Uh, in other words, you go under the water and then you go up into the cavities, which are the houses. And the houses get uh, supra-elevated with new rooms when the families grow larger. Sometimes, if they've gone to the fourth floor, they go out and build more on the outside so that then you can have another floor on the inside. So there are these underground incredible cities. But um, they also maintain and regulate the water levels so that the doors are never above water, which means that if there's drought, they start working on canal systems and so on to, uh, they can close um, also leakages uh, perfectly so that water doesn't seep and they don't put their finger in the hole. And it's very difficult to keep water from seeping. It's not an easy uh, feat of, of engineering. They can organize running water in icy weather to allow for breathing under the surface. They are basically, according to uh, James and Carol Gould, project designers and engineers. And this ability is uh, clearly based on reason and process, processing experience into problem solving, rem remembering and processing experiences. So this goes quite against Aristotle's view. Um, but there are other, now we could go on with the beavers. I had so much to tell you about the beavers. Uh, but I did want to tell you that um, I mentioned Adolf Portman. And this is where I get to this somehow. Adolf Portman was a zoologist who wrote a book called The Form of Animals in 1948. And he tried to prove that the forms animals make, their forms, are not only consequences of necessity, however for purposes of survival of the species. He went against the scientific vision of his time, which saw utility in all forms, purpose in all forms, beneath and behind all these forms, uh, in some sort of invisible sphere that the naked eye could not see, in this invisible sphere of the microscope. What he did was he confronted evolutionary theory and findings with morphology, the study of the shape and forms of these, both the animals and the things that the animals make. And therefore, he tried to create a dialogue between aesthetics and biology. And what he came across is the idea that all living organisms in the world seem to have an impulse to appear to others, to be seen by others, to be desired or imitated by others in a state that is close to our view, indeed, of the inutility, the purposelessness of artistic practice if we want to take the modern enlightenment notion of autonomy of art as one of the definitions of art. Because if we take the activist definition of art, we don't have a problem. The beaver dam is art. If we don't want to take that and we want to take the other view, which is the autonomous art view, we can do that. And we still are OK with the findings. Uh, in other words, all sentient beings seem to want to be looked at for one reason or another, or make things that are to be looked at. And this is something that Hannah Arendt actually reads, and she quotes in her Denk, Denktagbuch, in her notebooks, um, in her diaries, she refers to this to somehow state that surfaces are of importance. And we are at the time of na nascent phenomenology. Um, and she's in particular interested in his notes about butterflies and the beauty, his text, The Beauty of Butterflies, uh, from 1951, which she seems to have read. Okay, now to go back to usefulness for a minute, <clears throat> these are called weaver ants, and they weave, they collaborate together to move, to make forms of cloth and move leaves. These, this is the underground, the <coughs> cast of the underground uh, architecture of uh, the ants, their living quarters. 
These ants also have agriculture. Uh, there are ants that m millions of years before humans um, devised ways of bringing certain um, plants, chewed up plants into their underground tunnels and houses and grow certain fungi that they eat. They don't eat the leaves, they eat the fungi that grow on the leaves. That's called agriculture. Uh, these are um, termite um, skyscrapers and um, quite interesting. Termites, bees, and ants are all of the same family of beings. They are so-called superorganisms. Edward Wilson from Harvard and his colleague, German colleague, uh, wrote the book about the superorganism, uh, I think around 1991. Um, and I think it's a very interesting book because uh, it studies how, col through collaboration, certain forms of living spaces or cultural artifacts are, are made, and what are the languages of these uh, non-sentient, so-called non-sentient beings that are actually very sentient, are, for example, the bee dance. The bee dance uh, won Carl von Fritsch the Nobel Prize in, after discovering it in 1948. Uh, the bee dance is not only uh, a way to, these are drawings from von Fritsch, I think, the dance from the bees, later drawings. They are not only ways to um, indicate through the, sh the, the, the figure eights and the number of figure eights, the distance f that flowers with, with f well, the, the liquid um, nectar are from the hive to the other bees. They don't only do that. They are actually a symbolic language. Uh, so uh, the symbolic lang the, the, the proof of somehow that there is not a, a simply an imitation of something, but actually the use of arbitrary symbols and therefore language, was done with this experiment of deviation. As you see on the right-hand side, the left-hand side it just describes the whole distance and the place from the flowers and the bees that went back to their fellow bees to, to um, tell them that there's nectar somewhere. Uh, what the bees that were told where the nectar was did, they did not fly around the house, which is what was um, like a, f a forced trail. This is an experiment that was done, made. But they actually flew over the house and went in a quicker way. So it is actually a definition of a geographic point, a coordinate. And these are some of the many researches. Oh, this is not a research. This I just threw in because I thought it was pretty. It's a human, um, it's a, one of those Sahara, I think. I'm not sure actually where this is from. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, drawings of um, taking honey, uh, humans and bees living together. Uh, one of the earliest drawings of that, which to me also tells me a lot about our lines, the lines that we trace honey, taking honey, beehives, how we make the beehives also copying bee, beehives, natural beehive, beehive in a tree trunk naturally, in a pot, natural, then modernist beehives. This is beginning 20th century, we suddenly invent this stuff. It's very interesting, the interactions between human architecture and bees, and we think that the, these are still used today as being the best ones for whatever reason. This is new design that has been a failure by Philips, and this is just a hairdress. I just thought I'd throw that in a <laughs> beehive. OK, um, I wanted to show you the octopus. But now what is really important is that we end. So I would like to just tell you about the bowerbirds. Now, the bowerbirds are Australian birds that went, when the first explorers went to Australia, they thought that they were a pygmy people that made these interesting religious play, th altars that looked like homes, but that were never homes. They were more like altars. Now, the bowerbirds actually do this for mating purposes. But as we just said, I think all art is for mating purposes. So <laughs> that doesn't tell me anything. But the interesting thing about the Australian bowerbirds, so these are not the homes of the bowerbirds. The bowerbirds will all live maybe seven years before being able to mate with a, with a partner. They then are generally monogamous, generally. I mean, they have divorce, but it's more or less like humans. But these are uh, elaborate seduction devices or sculptures or installations made by bowerbirds that um, 
different power birds have different styles. So you cannot say in the same species, this is where aesthetic choice comes in. In the same species of bower birds, you don't have, or in the same location, they don't all make them with red or blue. They have different tastes and they compete with each other. The male, they're only male sculptors in this case. And they spend half their time destroying the other bower birds' sculptures and half their time repairing or making their own. So there's also the reparation, which is a very advanced and sophisticated ability, the concept of repairing something that is broken and going to get. And they, they go and they find certain, some, some people like, some of them like red, some of them like blue. You know, it's a very in interesting stylistic differences between the different modernist birds. Uh, now, the last thing, you said, uh, you remember I told you that uh, humans portray other species, but other species don't portray other species. But that's not necessarily true either, because of course mimicry is greatly studied, for example, by Klaus Lunau, the most well-known heir of von Fritsch, who works today in Germany, but also Lacan wrote about mimicry and uh, in, in animals and the gaze and desire. And here we have not a face of a bird but, or of an owl, but we have clearly a butterfly, but looks like eyes. Now, the interesting thing is that these are prey to these. <laughs> so we have a case of mimicry, of imitation, of camouflage of the other species in order to protect oneself from that species. So it is one of the, th I mean, you might think that this is outrageous, but um, there is quite consensus amongst uh, butterfly experts that butterflies develop forms of mimicry of other species that are their predators in order to escape their predators. So how the hell can we explain that? I mean, it's obviously something that has happened through evolution. It is, it's, it's, it is about co-evolution. It, um, it is about all these mysterious things. So we can either believe in God, or we can say that there's forms of incredible interaction and communication between species that are not between single individuals, but are between other more hidden, layered, time-full, not timeless, relations through hundreds of thousands of years. And um, of course, the Darwin observation was why the hell certain orchids and certain insects looked alike. <laughs> there was no reason for that. And they belong to different evolutionary strands. And yet, and they don't even need for pollination. So, and yet we do have these cases of gender blurring, let's say, between plants and, and um, animal species uh, that occur throughout the whole place. The last was the bird of paradise I want to show you, which I can't show you. So there you go. Uh, I'm not going to show you the hungry chimp. I'm not going to show you, uh, I'm not going to show you painting apes, the paintings that they make or the elephant paintings. But there's a lot of discussion around whether that's unethical or not. And then I wanted to show you the work that are collaborations. So there were many collaborations in Documenta by humans and non-humans that I see as intended with collaboration. Alora and Calzadillo was a video that I wanted to show. It's a concert played for a vulture with a flute, prehistoric flute borrowed from a museum in Germany made with the bone of the ancestor of this animal so that perhaps we, you know, music comes from trying to imitate the birds and we use the, the flute, the, the bone, because maybe the bone might sound like the bird sings. And so on. Again, this is art. This is co-evolution of art from one species to another. Um, we can see them maybe after questions. This is Brian Jungen, who uh, is a Danny ha half Danny, half Swiss uh, Canadian West Coast artist, who in the documenta made sculpture uh, for the dogs of the visitors with dogs. And you had to have a dog to be able to visit the sculpture park. So I thought they would be people renting dogs, but that didn't happen, actually. Uh, but this is, of course, the shape and the form. He studied, of course, dog parks and worked on that concept. So it's a kind of collaboration. Uh, Christina Buch is a very interesting artist who worked in collaboration with butterflies to make this garden uh, that 
I've discussed in the institute, um, she was uh, re rearing the butterflies in her home. I've got to end this. She had also done sculpture with chimps, and she now lives with her chicken. And she's working with the chicken on a project that will end with the soup, actually, and eating the soup of the chicken. So it's about living and dying together and eating each other. And it's called, what baffles me is that you are still alive. <laughs> she's done projects with rabbits, get, playing games and carrots and things. This, is, uh, this rabbit project was done in George Machunas' X studio in New York, which was an alternative art space today, and that's her, the most gorgeous woman. That's not part of the artwork. That's just her and the rabbit having relaxing after not performing for people, and so on. And this she sent me the other day. She just said, oh, look, there's a tight-knit family, but it's not an artwork. There was Fernando Dori Gar Garcia Dori, who is a Spanish artist, Basque artist, who collaborates with sheep and shepherds, and um, he it is a whole other thing if you're interested. Pierre Rigg's piece I mentioned, the untilled matrix place, which was both a co you know, made by many beings, from the bees to the people, to the ants, to the growth. And there was the video. And there in the little house, this is the house where I showed the video, the Judith Hopp video that I mentioned. This little house is for the ducks in the winter in Kassel. So there's no floor, and we built a little passerelle so that you could walk through it and watch the videos. So it was sort of videos for ducks and people. But being in the summer, we weren't disturbing the ducks. But the fish, you could see the fish and watch the videos. And it, it just created a kind of synesthetic environment for seeing art that was video-based. so many of the elements there. Um, there is a moment, obviously, for someone to ask any questions or comments or engage uh, before we lure you back to the old mining building to reward you for your patience with some wine and some nibbles if you would like to come. So if anybody wants to ask a question or make a comment or ask a clarification, um, I have to turn it on mute. Is anybody interested in? Or polemic. I mean, you, you may also disagree with this mad. The most important thing I skipped, some pages, were about speculative fabulation and science fiction. Uh, you know when I said, what stories do we want to tell so that other stories may be told? This is a story that I told. It has some scientific basis, but it is a story about the future and about the past. And I have a stuck DVD Thank again. Thank you very much, Carmen, um, for this really, really you know, broad, broad sense talk about uh, the human and non-human animals. And um, I, I have a disagreement because you okay. just encourage it. So um, I, was, I was wondering what the, um, the little film, the clip that you that you've shown, um, you know, on Hans on the horse. In which ways did that relate or support your thesis about the entanglement between the non-human and the human, or, or were you were you talking about something something else? Yeah. Something? Well, that was. I he... found it very very ironic, and you know, it was very very informative, making it even you know very German, <laughs> if I may say so, you know, in, in a type of almost Schadenfreude. Yes, well, um, uh, Judith Hopp is the artist. She was the character with the horse. So um, it is true that that is the first piece I showed you. Um, and there were many other pieces that were in still images. So one must not prioritize that over Pierre Rigg's Untilled or Christina Buch's um, garden with uh, butterflies or many other, the Brian Jungen. So I wouldn't want to uh, reduce the whole talk to one piece. Uh, however, uh, it is true that I over, uh, how do you say, I underestimated the time. So the 
other video components of this talk were not shown, but we can show them in the institute. So, but that's just the beginning of the answer. To continue with the answer, I did choose that piece at the beginning to um, express a relation between Vincienne Desprez's text, where she says, okay, the, the horse could not count. So, uh, because the story of Hans is used in the history of science to disprove quack scientists who would say that non-human animals are smart or intelligent. So one of the stories was Hans the horse. Ah, they can count, they can count. It was disproved, ah, that's quack. But Vincienne says no, because what was actually proven with that was an incredible perceptive ability. Not that, that the animal could count with human mathematics, but that the animal could understand and perceive and enter into a very clear observation situation with the non-horse, meaning the human. So I wanted to illustrate that. And there happens to, it's a unique case where there is an artwork which is precisely connected to a text that I wanted to discuss in relation to the question. So it, is, it was impossible not to show it. But if one is to discuss that piece only in itself without anything else, then I would say that there are many layers to that piece, that that piece speaks about the status of art and spectacle, for sure. You know, that's the art audience, and that is the artist with her artwork. That is Judith Hopf with her horse. And that is the art audience. They're the clowns coming in their Mercedes to the exhibition, all flying in with their airplanes. So there's clearly an antagonism with the spectacle of the art world, which is a whole other discussion. There is a layer which has to do with institutions and institutionalization, which she is referring to in that piece, which is the obligation. She has made works uh, um, connected with Breitenau, for example, the, the girls' reformatory there, and she herself was in very repressive schools. Uh, and so she is sides with Ulrike Meinhof in her critique of the repressive nature of institutions such as schools. So this place is also a school, the school for training horses, the school for training the non-human animal. And there's an undercurrent, which is a critique of the horrors of the way that we deal with non-human species. So in that sense, it relates to the discussion of animal rights. And not, so it's not an illustration of a collaboration between a human and a non-human, but it would be a case of a denunciation. In fact, now on a biographical level, it is interesting to know that uh, Judith Hopf, her sensibility towards these questions, uh, towards the marginalized, towards the non-human animal as marginalized and her identification with them comes also from her personal story. She was crippled as a child and she could not walk. Uh, she uh, walks now, uh, but she learned to ride horse before learning to walk. So the relationship with the horse for Judith Hopf is on a personal biographical level of great importance. One doesn't need to know that, but she could move with the horse. So her, in her own personal life, um, there was a collaboration, not in this art piece. But I'm sure that this fact that she learned to ride before learning to walk when she was 10 or whatever, 8 or 10 years old, um, is in the subconscious of why she made this piece. But it's not explicitly in it at all. But she does not move in the piece. The only people who move are these clowns who then there's so many things. I mean, there's Brecht. There's a bunch of German things going on in that piece, as you said. So I would say that it connects to the Vincent des Prés, and it connects to the animal rights and to, to that. But it certainly doesn't um, only speak about oppression of institutions. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, I was, um, when I was looking at the bees and I was thinking about my visit to uh, Documenta, I was thinking about kind of colonization. How lovely. Thank you for visiting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, what were you thinking of? I was particularly thinking about the little kind of conurbation of um, Fiesta Gates and um, Tino Segal. And these two very different kind of ways of uh, kind of colonizing um, uh, those areas, whether, I mean, kind of inhabiting them. But I was also thinking 
this kind of slight kind of paradox or something that seems quite natural and kind of just happens. Um, but you know, the actual kind of incredible resources and planning and preparation and the kind of reason and uh, um, uh, so kind of something that's natural and something that's incredibly planned. But I, I just might wonder whether you can maybe just talk a bit about this idea of the kind of artists and the artwork colonizing. Mm. Something that can well, uh, you, well, you're using colonize as in a bee colony. You're saying because you're not I'm saying colonize like yeah, colonialism. I'm, I'm trying to uh, um, stay clear of the politics of. Uh, I was thinking in terms of the bees. The bees. Uh, so you mean in, inhabiting and, and yeah. living in yes. and um, parasiting mm. a certain environment, like the tree bees will make their hive in it. Well, first of all, the first part you're saying two different things. So the first thing you said um, is about the apparent naturality versus the apparent planning. I would never use the term naturality because I don't believe in, there is a distinction between nature and culture. I don't think that that exists or ever existed. I mean, I see civilizations in bees. So it's all, to me, it's all culture or it's all nature. And it's turtles all the way down, <laughs> to make a long story short from that perspective. So I do find a danger in um, looking for the natural in, in that kind of, even in ecology, in politics of ecology, like greening and so on. There's problems in that. Um, but I, in my opposition of archive to compost, that's, uh, uh, you could say that the archive would be the planning structure, the underlying structure. Well, there wasn't much of it. You know, I'm spending the next, the, these years, uh, rationalizing things that were done instinctively, peop, the scientists would say, or subconsciously, you know. I mean, I did a lot intuitively. Uh, because, I mean, there were some maps in some senses, the four positions, if, if you come to the institutes, you'll know. There were some very broad things that were planned, but a lot was not really that intentional, but kind of happened beautifully. So Tino Segal and Theaster, I didn't really know what Theaster would do. So I had this idea of dark space and a, a, a dark, lively space and a light, lively space. Light and lively space, dark and lively space. I had that. So Theaster and Tino. But beyond that, it was not programmed or planned. Well, I mean, in terms of division of labor, in terms of like, um, you know, all these young people working for um, uh, Oh, Oh, the bees. Oh, I cut you. Yeah. The workers. Yeah, the, the, workers. The, the, the Oh, I see. I see. Well, that's interesting. Um, well, to go back to the superorganism, I have to say that um, there was a lot of direction initially from Tino, Segal, to the dancers, singers, whatever you want to call them, in preparation. But there was also a certain number of rules, which I can't go into right now, but <coughs> there are rules that actually make it uncontrolled by the artist. So um, it ends up in its proliferation to be a kind of unscripted piece. And Theaster Gates, even more so, was not at all scripted by Theaster, not much scripted. So uh, there was a presence of an initial impetus of an, a vision, Theaster's vision, of bringing um, materials from houses in Chicago in the south side to Castle and to restore this building with also unemployed laborers from Castle. There was a whole thing about labor, labor conditions, money. It was very kind of political thing about that that was planned. But once that was triggered, the actual um, worker bees in the piece were um, paid and were, so they're not precarious laborers of cognitive capitalism. And they were also uh, rather s not free in the sense of everybody's free and just fooling around, but autonomously directed in a system that worked just like bees. So to go back to the superorganism, it's very interesting how Edward Wilson writes about the superorganism being a society which is basically anarchist. I mean, the queen bee doesn't really exercise much power except for in two things. 
whether or not to allow the small potential queen bees to be fed the food that will then enable them to become queen bees in the case of storming. And second, when to storm, that's all. That's the only power that is exercised by the queen bee. So there's a whole system of um, working together and collaborating and sharing that has to do with the age of the bees, for example. Like if you're a certain age, you're at the door, you can't really fly very well, so you're protecting the door from other bees. Bees can't enter a colony. But you can emigrate, for example. If you bring a lot of nectar, you're from another hive, you can be accepted. So it's very interesting, the society of bees. Uh, and then uh, there are certain, um, so they are seen to be as kind of anarchist formations. I mean, it's interesting politically. But that is how Edward Wilson and Bert, whatever his name is, Hol and uh, read it in recent times, like 1990. It is true that in the early 20th century, I think that authoritarian regimes also may have used some of the societies that are appeared to be authoritarian as models for a good, better society in order to further fascism. And we do know that Uixkul, who was one of the first ethologists to write about behavior of um, colony species, did write the uh, introduction to um, a, a, a British Nazi writer. Gee, this is all going to go on tape. What if it's all speculative fabulation? This is all just my memories, but I don't know, called Chamberlain. But it's not the same Chamberlain. It's another Chamberlain. <laughs> But somebody has to Google it with their smartphone here. If Wixkul did write the introduction to a text by Chamberlain. So there are these strange usages that things were put to in different periods. But does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's kind of, it wasn't really a question, but thanks for talking about it. Yeah. Oh, well, I talked about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to draw it to, to an end because Carolyn has talked to us for a long time, you've listened for a long time, Dave's filled for a long time, and it's the end of the day. But I do want to just conclude by um, identifying two things that I think are very relevant. One, obviously, the kind of transdisciplinary framework, the kind of knowledge that you display, which is, I think, very much to do with what we're encouraging amongst all of you, the sense that there is no field of knowledge that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be wrapped up or kept enclosed in particular sort of horse boxes, such as we put ourselves into, as we put animals of knowledge, but there's an absolute necessity for these conversations. Secondly, that I think the whole field of the questions of human, the humanities relates to what is being defined as the human, and the ways of interrogating it through the both the view that you've given us of certain trajectories in both art and, and Western philosophy bring us up to these, um, this extremely polemical, extremely political, extremely provocative areas of having to rethink human exceptionalism. But you have given us also a very clear sense of the kind of chronologies and the political framework, what's at stake. Yeah, the pitfalls, because yeah, it's pitfalls. complex. It, it can be too. very dangerous also. So this is not, as it were, party to a kind of animalism or a simple post-humanism, but it's precisely that critical self-interrogation that I think opens up um, to more than speculative fabulation, but precisely <laughs> that question that it matters what knowledges we produce, what yes. stories we tell, what narratives we produce, what archives we keep. And I love the idea of sense of composting is this kind of generative space of multi-usages. Now, I'm just going to finish with one of the books that I'm reading at the moment is by uh, a woman called Temple Grandin, hmm. who is the figure who designs abattoirs, hmm. precisely because she is profoundly autistic and only realized as she grew up that not everybody saw in pictures. But hmm. because she has this particular um, ability to see in pictures, she can also imagine how animals see the world. Hmm. And so is advising people in the production of the construction of abattoirs, which will minimize the, the anxieties that the animals go through, because she works out what they see. That's so interesting. The, so the, forms of the empathy. Their eyes and the things that cause them um, distress are often to do with 
uh, shiny things or things that they you know sort of like so don't put metal down the side what kind of things so apparently so it's, 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 it is not just the simplicity of someone who's caring for animals because she's a caring human being something but actually it pr brings back to your sense of the living and dying that the real tensions of what it is to co-inhabit this planet with with life which involves death and usage is not just simply yeah, sharing this planet but it does actually yeah. raise extremely profound questions as to who and what we are. And obviously, we go back to the documentary scene. So anybody wants to follow this up with discussion, some of you are lined up to come to the, um, uh, uh, the institute, which is, as I say, is a seminar which we run to have a chance to chew over these things. So thank you for your attention, and please join me in thanking once again. Thank you.